Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mino Takashi. I'm Deputy Director of Tokyo College. Um, first, on behalf of Tokyo College, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Ms. Katrin Maltzal, uh, the author of the book, Who Cooked Adam Smith's Dinner, uh, for taking the time to have a conversation with researchers of Tokyo College. Tokyo College is an organization of the University of Tokyo established in 2019 to serve as an interface between the University of Tokyo and overseas researchers and research institu institutions, and also to promote cross-disciplinary research and conversation. One of the missions of Tokyo College is to invite early career researchers from all over the world and provide them with opportunities to do cutting edge research. And in fact, uh, this event is organized by such researchers of Tokyo College having um, quite diverse academic background. Another mission of Tokyo College is to, speak, uh, to share knowledge with the wider public and the society through lectures, workshops, and symposia. And of course, this event is a part of such activities. So I hope that all the participants, including our main speaker today, Ms. Katrin Malsal, researchers of Tokyo College, and all the audience will enjoy this close disciplinary conversation. So have a good time. Dear Mino Sensei, thank you very much for your opening remark and uh, introduction of Tokyo College and our reading group. Before we give a word to our main speaker, uh, the author of International Bestsellers Who Cooked Adam Smith Dinner and Mother of Invention, Katrin Marsal, I would like to say a couple of words about the flow of today's event. My name is Maria Tilegina. I'm a project assistant professor here at Tokyo College and one of the organizers of the Tokyo College Reading Group. In this reading group, Tokyo College researchers with different backgrounds read a book together and invite the author and the audience to discuss it. Today, we are talking about an international bestseller on economics and women. Who Cooked Adam Smith's Dinner, which was originally published in 2012, but it was translated into Japanese and published here only at the end of the last year. First, we will ask Katrin to talk about the book. Then I and my colleagues with whom we read and discussed the book will ask her some questions we had as a result of our discussions. And after that, we will have some time to ask Katrin some questions received from the audience. So dear viewers, please find a Q&A Q button uh, at uh, the bottom of your Zoom panel. So if you have uh, questions for Catherine about who cooked Adam Smith's dinner, please write them to the Q&A section. We accept questions both in English and Japanese. Also, please find uh, the translation tab in the menu below uh, if needed. Please also note that recording of this event is prohibited. Now, to the main part of the event. Katrin, could you please introduce the book and explain what has changed since it was first written? Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me and thank you so much for reading my book. It's a, it's a great honor. Um, I am, and I'm really looking forward to discussing these ideas with, with all of you here today. I am calling in from the United Kingdom um, and we have the hottest day ever <laughs> in um, the history of, of Britain. So I will be 
drinking a lot of, of water and trying to manage here in the heat, but it's, it's wonderful speaking to you. Um, so my name is Katrine Marsal. I'm an author and financial journalist. I am Swedish, but I live in Britain since about 10 years. Um, and I wrote this book, Who Cooked Adam Smith's Dinner, as was mentioned kindly in the introduction, more than 10 years ago, actually. Um, and I was a young financial journalist and um, the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009 had just happened, which as you know, was it started in, in the American economy with the fall of the investment bank Lehman Brothers. And then it led to a credit crunch and a financial crisis that impacted very large parts of the world. And even though Sweden is a country quite far removed from, from the US and far up north, uh, we were also very impacted, of course, and, um, um, and this was something that I was covering as a journalist. And when this global financial crisis happened, there was a lot of discussions around what had gone wrong. So what was the sort of misunderstanding of, of economics and of markets that led to almost everybody underestimating these problems and how quickly they could spread and what havoc they could cause in the global economy. And that was the background for me wanting to do this book because at the time, and um, there was a lot of questioning about economic assumptions and economic models and discussions around, you know, neoliberalism and neoclassical economics and could there be other approaches should we look at behavior economics and so on and I wanted to add a feminist perspective to that discussion because I felt that a lot of the things that the field that's you know often called feminist economics had been talking about for decades was uh, actually very relevant in trying to understand why the standard models of economic thought you know couldn't predict this crisis and also had had other problems and as you know i'm not an academic um i'm you know i'm a journalist so i wanted to do it as a as a journalistic book and i also wanted it to hopefully be um funny and entertaining and something that a broad audience uh, wanted to engage with and read because i am quite passionate about taking the, um, the language of, of economics, which is a, a language that's taken incredibly seriously in, in society and, and try to make it more accessible to people because I, I do think economics is, is far too important to be left to the economists. And so I wrote this book, um, and I was very young at the time, and I never thought it would have the kind of uh, life that it has had. And it's been translated into more than um, 20 languages. And it's taken me um, out in the world. And as you can see, I, I still have the privilege of, of, of speaking about these ideas. So I will, I will quickly just um, um, go through the, you know, what I think of as the, 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 the basic and, and main points of of the argument I make in the book, and then I look forward to the to the discussion. So I'm going to share some. Well, is that um, if my my slides are working like that? Yes. Um, do you see my slides there? Sorry, can it looks I a bit. I'm strange. sorry. No, I uh, don't see. Your Let's see. It worked before. Otherwise, I can. I'm happy to speak um, without the slides, but um, I'll do one more try. When we tested before, it did work. So, what about um, like that? Okay, I can see your slides. Could we? Check? Okay, great. Okay. Right. Yes. Um, yes. So, I'm going to go through, you know, the main the main points. Just to, you know, I know some of you have have, have read the book. So who cooked Adam Smith's dinner? Um, I have since uh, written some other books too, or one other book too, uh, Mother of Invention, which is about, I'm just gonna mention it. Um, it is being translated into Japanese right now. I don't know when it's coming out, I'm guessing next year, but it's a book that has to do more with 
what has to do with the history of innovation and technology from a feminist perspective, trying to look at it through a different lens. So that's a slightly different story. But I'm here to talk about this book. This is the US edition of Who Cooked Adam Smith's uh, Dinner. Um, and what I, what I do in that book is I try to, for the reader, take it back to the fundamental question of economics, which Adam Smith, the Scottish philosopher and founding father of economics, asks in his uh, great book, The Wealth of Nations from 1776. And that question is, how do you get your dinner? which is fundamentally a very good economic question, uh, not just in the current uh, environment with all of the supply chain problems that we are currently experiencing in the economy, but also in general. We take it for granted that we can go to the store and there will be food there to buy, that the store will be open, that there will be somebody there, there to sell us what we want and that they will accept our money and so on. But actually for these things to to, to take place, a lot of quite complex economic processes need to happen in a coordinated way. And to Adam Smith, he was very fascinated by this. You know, it's, it's amazing. Why does this, you know, complex thing uh, called, you know, the economy actually work? What keeps it all together? And he was in a way, he was looking very much at Isaac Newton um, a few years earlier, who seemed to have explained um, the universe and the way the planets worked um, in a comprehensible way. And Adam Smith was in a way looking to sort of figure out the social system in a similar way as to what Isaac Newton seemed to have done with the universe and with physics. So he was almost looking for, you know, what makes the economy work. And he was looking for almost one force like gravity in Newtonian physics that could explain all of this and so this is his question how do you get your dinner and the very famous answer um, in the book is it is not from the benevolence of the butcher the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner but from their regard to their own self-interest so that's a very famous quote of course and what he means is that the butcher the brewer or the baker they do not go to work out of um, love or because they really care about their customers they might do that as well uh, or because they really care about bread making or or the butchery where they work they do it in essence in order to turn a profit uh, they do it in regard to their own self-interest and what's interesting about this quote is you know one thing what Adam Smith meant with it but what you know what I look at in the book is is what economists that came after him took and took from this and made this into uh, and they made an awfully big deal out of this quote and economics and I think Adam Smith himself would probably have been quite horrified <laughs> in a sense because his writing is is actually much more nuanced as I'm sure um, most of you know but economics, the way it developed, really, really emphasized this idea of self-interest. And economics has even been called the science of self-interest. And often when we talk about thinking like an economist, we mean going in, looking at a situation and analyzing it based on assumptions around that everybody in this situation is individuals acting out their own self-interest and doing this in a rational way. Um, so that's, and this is also the foundation of sort of the standard um, models of, of, of economics that, you know, we are taught uh, at least in the beginnings of our economics degrees at, at universities, then it tends to get slightly more complicated. But um, I'm an interest, I was interested in this idea of self-interest uh, because it almost became to economics that self-interest was like gravity in Newtonian physics. It was the force that kept the economy going and kept everything working. And this idea that if everybody just serves their own self-interest, then magically the market will somehow turn this into growth and growth. It's what's you know, the, the most important thing for everybody. 
So it's almost a magical thing through the invisible hand of the of the market. The invisible hand is also a concept that comes from Smith, even though he doesn't talk about it that much, actually, in The Wealth of Nations. Through the invisible hand of the market, human selfishness, in a sense, or self-interest actually turns into what's the common good. So it's, it's almost a magical thing. But this is a, a feminist book. And um, so I, I challenge these assumptions by, by saying, OK, the funding question of economics is how do you get your dinner? But let's look at Adam Smith's life. Who cooked Adam Smith's dinner? And the answer to that question is, is his, well, a big part of the answer to that question is his mother who was called uh, Margaret Douglas. Um, so she was widowed when Adam Smith was, was very young and spent all of her life looking after her son and um, managing the household together with uh, another female cousin called Janet Douglas. And these two women were incredibly important to Adam Smith. If you look at his, um, the letters he wrote or his other writing, not his economic writing, it's very clear how important these women were to him and how much he, he loved them. But that insight is not something that he brings with him into his thinking around economics. And what I argue in the book is that that would have been a good thing if he had done so. Because actually, you know, in order to answer the founding question of economics, how do you get your dinner? You can't just look at the butcher, the brewer, or the baker. It's not just about going out and purchasing what you need to make dinner. Somebody needs to cook it as well. And the point I try to make in the book is that most often, as is, is the case, was the case with Adam Smith, this somebody is a woman. This unpaid work around the house um, is something that women have been expected to do to a larger extent than men, and something that is incredibly fundamental to any economy. You need somebody to look after the children, look after the elderly, cook the food. Uh, but because Adam Smith <laughs> forgot about his mother and her contribution to this founding question of economics, how do you get your dinner? None of these things have traditionally been counted as economic activities. So even a measurement like GDP um, is, you know, we do not calculate that by, we, don't, we do not include the unpaid work around the house uh, as part of GDP. So hence, very big chunks of our economies become invisible to economic statistics. And this is particularly, you know, as, been have point, as has been pointed out by feminist economics, economists like um, Marilyn Waring, for example, um, this is particularly a problem in developing countries where these informal parts of the economy can be very, very big. And it's, it's um, such a shame and also a mistake that, you know, you have an, a 12 year old girl in a developing economy somewhere who every morning goes and fetches firewood and water and works around the village all day um, <clears throat> doing lots of things. And what she does is not counted as work. It's not counted as something that contributes to the economy of her country. And all of this also becomes invisible to us. Because of these assumptions, you know, coming from the way Adam Smith answered this, this question back in the 1700s, that this work by women um, is not something that we need to look at in economics. It's this assumption that it's not part of the economy. It's something that women just do. It's like a natural resource. We do not have to think about it why it's performed, the incentives, you know, the, we don't have to look at how, how large it is or how it grows or shrinks. It's just not an economic question or something that affects the rest of the economy. And what I argue in the book is that this is, is, is actually a mistake that prevents us from, from understanding um, what goes on um, in our economies and also 
leads to the exclusion of certain values from from economics, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a second. Um, so I'm just going to do uh, two more sort of main points from the book, and then we can open it up to two questions. So from this exclusion of women and this idea that economics should be the science of self-interest, the central character of standard economic theory was born. And we tend to call him homo economicus, a rational economic man. So this is a set of assumptions that economics tends to make about human beings, about uh, who we are, or more specifically, the parts of us that are economically relevant, what they are and why we act the way we do. And the assumptions are the ones here that, you know, we are individuals, we're out to maximize profit or utility uh, in every situation. There's this flawless rationality. Human beings come into any situation of economic choice as these perfect calculators, able to calculate what's in it for me in the best possible way. We assume sort of that these these uh, rational people have perfect information about the consequences of their actions and other people's actions, that they're guided by a narrow self-interest um, and that their preferences remain constant and unchanging. So these are assumptions in, in a lot of economic modeling, obviously not all of it, but that's sort of the basis of it. And the case I, I make in the book is that, you know, let's look at this person as a character. He's rational, he's independent, he's focused on himself, he's never vulnerable, and there is no context to him. He has no family, no emotions, he's not affected by any of these things. And the point I try to make in the book is that every single characteristics that we assume human beings possess in standard economic theory are characteristics that we are taught to see as male as well. And everything that economics goes to great lengths, excluding from its models and its thinkings, are things that we are taught to view as feminine. So vulnerability, dependency on other people, family, emotions, all of these things that we know from psychology and sociology is, are actually incredibly important in explaining why people do what they do in the economy and why you know, economic financial bubbles can emerge and so on. We are not these rational, independent, um, perfect calculators um, unaffected by other people. That's not the case. But still in economics, we assume that that's the case. And the argument I make in the book is that a lot of that has to do with, with our insistence on excluding women from economics and also everything that in any way can be associated to femininity. And that that is also a problem because it gives us a very inaccurate picture of what human beings are and why they act the way they do. And I also argue that this is a very seductive model that even though for decades we've known that this is not how human beings act, we still uh, are very drawn to these assumptions because they make the world very rational and predictable and uh, neat um, and not messy. <laughs> and that's why we like it, but that doesn't make it, it accurate or uh, a good sort of map to run the world economy based on. Um, and just so we can talk all about these things uh, more, I'm just giving you a general overview. So how should sort of Adam Smith, you know, have updated his, his, um, his thinking on the economy? Well, a feminist economist like Hazel Henderson, you know, often talks about the economy more like a cake. <laughs> so um, this is my best um, shot at, at trying to illustrate that. But so that you do have, yes, you have the private and the public sector up here, the sort of top layers of the cake. And those are the bits that we count mainly count when it comes to GDP or the, like the formal uh, monetary economy. But and often the problem with economics is that we're only focused on these two top layers of the cake, the private and the public sector and looking at the interaction of these things. But the thing is, if you bring Adam Smith's mother in, you realize that there are more layers to this cake. You know, there's this social cooperative love economy is what Hazel Henderson talks about, for example. So that would be Adam Smith's mother cooking the dinner. 
Um, that would be uh, women um, looking after elderly parents for free. That would be the things we do for our neighbors or all the things we do not based for, for money, but for, for other reasons. Because the truth is we're not just driven by self-interest, but by lots of other things. And these things have economic consequences. And if this love economy doesn't work, neither the public sector or the private sector sort of can really function. And then underneath this love economy, there's another huge cake layer here, which is basically mother nature or nature or natural resources. And which is also something that economics, traditional economics, you know, does just take for granted as something that's just going to be there. And we tend to often look at, look at Earth as just this container for, for energy and not understand how these layers sort of fit together and how they all rest upon each other. And I think this is the fundamental thing that, that feminist economics can actually contribute with, is this sort of different understanding of, of what the economy is. And, and also this, um, this point that, that we are focused just up here on sort of the monetary economy too much and do not understand how all of it just fits together. And I think particularly uh, in times like these when sustainability is, is very important because of climate change, I do think that, that this, this understanding of the economy is, is a much better starting point. And I do think that is the challenge for me as well, you know, and what I like to think about is sort of, you know, how, how would an economics not built on the exclusion of women uh, look like? And, you know, how can we think about these problems differently without making this this mistake of just taking the work of of women and the role of women and the role that women are expected to perform in the economy for granted in the same way that unfortunately um, Adam Smith happened to do a couple of hundred years ago. So I'm going to stop there because I, I think that hopefully covers at least the main argument of, of the book and I very much look forward to your thoughts. Thank you very much for your amazing introduction. While uh, reading your book and while now listening to uh, your presentation, I had a lot of questions. Great. And um, from now, my colleagues and I are going to ask them. But I also want to remind our dear audience, please send your questions to Q&A se um, section two. Uh, we accept questions in both Japanese and uh, English. And now uh, I would like to ask my colleague uh, Hannah to introduce herself and to ask the first question. Hello, uh, my name is Hannah Dahlberg Dodd, and I'm a sociolinguist and a project researcher here in Tokyo College. Uh, I mostly research language use in media. Uh, so my question is going to be translation related <laughs> somewhat naturally. Um, so as you mentioned, this book has been translated, um, well, it was originally written in Swedish and then has been translated to date into over 20 languages, right? So how has the reception of the book differed between languages? Uh, and do you feel that this argument, uh, the argument in the book comes across differently in different countries or even related to like kind of when the book came out uh, and then more specifically in Japan? Um, and additionally, to what extent at all did you participate in the translation process of the book? Kind of the most salient difference to me is the difference in title, right? So like um, the, the change from the Swedish title, um, literally translated as the only sex, which kind of, you know, reads as a reference to Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex, to kind of forefronting that focus on Adam Smith that you see in like the English versions and hmm. the versions thereafter. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Yes. So it's it's a very humbling experience to be translated into lots of languages because, you know, I'm a writer and you know we we you know we take our own writing quite seriously because, uh, you know, we have to, and then it gets translated and you have no control, <laughs> uh, and and they will send you these lovely packages. Your agent will send you these lovely packages, in the post with the book and you open it and there you can't read anything in it often. Um, um, and you realize that they could make up anything <laughs> and put my name on it. Um, so um, 
but it's been it's been wonderful and i mean certainly yes so the title change from swedish to 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 uk was was basically because uh, an editor in the uk came up with a better title <laughs> and um uh, and also obviously adam smith is more famous in the uk than in than in sweden um yes the reception has been um different in in different i mean i i went to uh russia with it for example a few years ago and um you know which was the only economics department i ever been to where all the professors were women and you know they had very different questions than what i got in in spain or 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 in new york but and i do think this book is is um i think it was much more controversial when it came out i gave a talk at the london school of economics in 2015 um which was um some members of the audience were quite upset with me <laughs> um and um it was sort of a heated uh, discussion as i remember it um and i think today that would not have been the case because i do think um this idea that economics you know that the idea of care work and um the perspective of women needs to be included i think is much more mainstream than it was just six years ago at least here in europe um so i think if i went back to the london school of economics now i think it would be quite different at least the tone of it then you know of course there's certain economists that don't you know they they really believe in this model you know a rational economic man and that's what they do and you've got to respect that but i do think a lot has has happened and uh, but i could never have predicted that this book would still you know that people would still be interested in it 10 years on uh, in a sense it's kind of depressing because you know i would have wanted a lot of these things to be um, kind of solved <laughs> um that i talk about in 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 the book um and also involvement in translation process i wish i could i'm i'm quite involved in the translation from swedish to english uh, because i speak english um as well uh, yes which you probably have noticed um but not in not in other uh, translations and i tend to just um trust the publishers and my agent and so on thank you very much thank you thank you very much uh for for your question and for your response and uh we will just go on with all of uh, the questions that uh, we have and then uh, we'll have a discussion involving uh, questions from the audience so next question uh, we have from evan please could you introduce yourself and ask your question Uh, hello, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm Evan, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at Tokyo College studying history of technology and in particular artificial intelligence. So my question has to do with the figures of Adam Smith and of Adam Smith's mother, Margaret Douglas. And in particular, I was I wanted to know at what point during the writing of a book sparked in part by the financial crisis, Adam Smith and in particular Margaret Douglas came to have such a prominent role in your story. Well, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I, I think the starting point was was wanting to challenge the idea of Homo economicus because, you know, as I said, and as you um, say in your question, it was, you know, the financial crisis was was a spark for me, and 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 a lot of the discussion then was about the efficient market hypothesis, which was this idea that basically if everybody is is a rational uh, actor serving their own self interest then financial bubbles can't really be bubbles because uh, if everybody everything is just a reflection of rational individual actors then a price on that market is a like an aggregate of that rationality and hence also rational so and that clear that idea clearly contributed to the financial crisis of 2008 2009 that's i don't think that's a controversial thing to say so I think that was my starting point so because it was a discussion around that I thought we you know it would be useful to add like a feminist critique of this model of homo economicus as a person. So that's where it started. And then I had I think I had Adam Smith slightly sort of further down in the book and then my Swedish editor said no 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 no, no. <laughs> you know you need to start with you need to start with with the mother. <laughs> um so I think that was just the editor's eye um um and we kind of moved the book around um based on that um and then then obviously i i realized that that's that's a story that um 
uh, you know, and I think it's a it's a point that's been made by by other people. I think uh, maybe not this sort of big and you know uh, with such implications as I as I try to do in in the book. But his his relationship, his close relationship with his mother, is is very um, well known to sort of people who who have studied Smith. But it's I know it, it clearly it it resonates with uh, with people um, and. Um, um, so yes, but yeah, I, I guess it's it was it was the editor. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I remember when we were just beginning to read the book, uh, this uh, question came up, and as a group of researchers, the first thing that we try to do is to uh, find out. Did she actually cook it or not? <laughs> oh yeah, you can't. It's really hard to find out. So I think I, the way it's phrased in the book, it's sort of, um, uh, well, very you know, like we can't say that she cooked it. We don't know that. It's um, yeah. but she managed the household. Um, and um, and as I think, I mean, I think I say that in the epilogue of the book uh, as well. It's not just you know, you um, shouldn't blame Adam Smith too much you know it's not like Virginia Woolf couldn't cook either or um you know Karl Marx had a had a housekeeper and um um it's it's not just something that was um was Adam Smith but it's it's more because he he asked specifically asked the question how do you get your dinner uh and because he was so dependent on his mother you know more than <laughs> than I think uh, the general philosopher of the time um it's it's quite interesting Yes, it, it, it is, and it is really uh, relatable. And uh, now we have a question from Naoko. Could you please ask your question, introduce yourself? Yes, thank you very much, Katrin, for uh, this great um, presentation. And also, thank you very much for um, the presence today. We really enjoyed reading your book. My name is Naoko Hosokawa. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Tokyo College. And I'm also a social linguist. I'm interested in the question of language and identity, particularly related to language contact and uh, multilingualism. So um, at Tokyo College, we have invited some economists to discuss problems with the current economic system. And in the discussion, it has been pointed out that um, the recent pandemic uh, turned out to be a great turning point um, to reveal the vulnerability of the economic system and also uh, show that priorities and values in the society and in economy can change very quickly. So obviously you have mentioned that one of the uh, central issues in the book is the unpaid work that women provides to the families and societies. And I'd like to know um, if um, the pandemic, the recent pandemic has impacted um, the problem is related to the issue of care and also uh, whether uh, the way you look at these issues have changed after um, the pandemic, um, and if so, how? Thank you very much. Mm. Yeah, thank you. That's an excellent question. And um, I think the pandemic was actually one reason, um, you know, for example, this book in the US, suddenly when the pandemic came, it was, it came out in America in 2016, and it it didn't sell that well and then suddenly the pandemic comes and people um, were very interested and suddenly they were talking about this book and, and reading it again which was great and I do think exactly what you say it had to do with because it, it was a book uh, you know and not the only book but but looking at particularly this unpaid care sector and I think what happened you know going back to the the, the slide with the with the cake was that you know, you shut down large parts of the formal economy in order to protect society and people from a virus. But there's certain work in every economy that still needs to happen. And uh, a big chunk of that is looking after the children and, and um, the elderly and, and these things that, um, and suddenly when childcare shut down, I mean, here in the UK, schools shut and, and uh, daycare, and people had to still do their paid work and look after children at the same time it it wasn't working all the the children running into <laughs> zoom calls and and it was i think it was a very clear sort of um, um people were living <laughs> the reality of like the cake just collapsing 
Um, and, and I think also policymakers, I think in any crisis, there is not enough thinking around um, the, how these different layers impact each other. So, you know, even in, even in the normal, um, even like after a normal, more normal financial crisis than the, the pandemic, um, it's, you know, you end up often, you know, you get a problem with public finances and you cut back public services, you know, the, the second layer. But often what that leads to is, you know, old people still need to be looked after. So then there's a woman somewhere who, you know, who quits her job in order to look after her elderly parents because the facilities where they used to do that are not good anymore. So it's this cost that just moved around the cake. Um, but we can't see it if it's in one of the layers that that we are not uh, used to measuring or talking about. So. And I do think all of these things came to the forefront with the pandemic, and and um, and, and you know we'll see what what happens. But there is, a, in, you know, in some countries there's a discussion about how to make societies more resilient in terms of you know they talk about childcare as infrastructure, for example, which is a way of you know again you know language is your field sort of of, of talking about childcare as something. Uh, very fundamental to the economy you know we need roads we need childcare. so and I think that's a shift that's that's come about uh, with the pandemic in in some parts of the world and I think it's it's encouraging thank you very much very interesting yes thank you very much I think everyone is thinking about these topics uh, from different points of view at the moment and uh, it's really a pleasure to be able to discuss them with you uh, but now we we have um, the next next question from yuki yuki could you please uh, ask uh, your question introduce yourself thank you uh, my name is yuki terada it's my pleasure to meet you online today. And as a Japanese reader, I also read and enjoyed the translated version recently and English. And um, I am a project researcher at Tokyo College. And my main theme of research is the history of museum and culture in the Middle Eastern region and Iran and beyond. So with this as, as my background, I'm very interested to know more about the idea of inclusions of different um, cultural, religious or rituals, um, such as unpaid um, practices into the models of economy. Um, by reading your book, we believe that uh, there have been some attempts um, within economics to include women, care work, and related issues in economic models already. And there have been always been doubts and discussions about the concept of um, economic, economic man. Mm -hmm. um, however, the book seems to imply that such attempts have not uh, been less than successful. So what do you think uh, will be more promising direction for future economics uh, models, um, whether attempting to further include um, neglected elements like care work into a current models, or do you think building a completely new model from the ground up is necessary yeah yes thank you for that question no, that is of course the the big one i mean i think um things like as you say homo economicus or economic man has been criticized for a very long time and you know even you know the great english economists like john maynard keynes talked about emotion and animal spirits as you know something that affects people and um <clears throat> if economists and the you know, very neoclassical Chicago school, they tried to look at things like housework, but, but they did it in ways that, you know, I talk about in the book, I found problematic, because it's basically applying this homo economicus model to, to women, and sort of stirring, and it doesn't quite work, I argue in the book. And then there's, you know, there's been a huge interest in, in things like behavioral economics, since I, I would probably say in the last 10 years. And, I mean, I think that's that's great. I, I do think, um, you know, I would prefer to sort of take it further. I think this it's fundamentally, I think maybe, you know, there is a place for for models, but I think economics also needs to go out more and look at real markets and real situations and um, and be a social science to a larger extent as well. Um, 
it's sort of it been this sort of physics envy within economics where you want to be um, like physicists. Um, and, you know, I think there's a place for for a lot of that. I think in the in the pandemic, you know, clearly many of the economic models were, were very useful. Um, but um, but yes, I do think, you know, it's like the work of Eleanor Ostrom, the only woman to ever be uh, awarded the um, Nobel Prize in, in economics. Um, by my country, <laughs> the Nobel Foundation, you know, just looking at real situations, real markets, studying actual real people and not staring itself blind on this hype, you know, this theoretical model of human behavior that we know is not very accurate. And I think that's what needs to change. And I also think it's a value shift um, needed. I do think that when you include, I mean, your question was about inclusion, when you ex include women, it's not just about including women, it's also we have taken a lot of things and said that they're feminine, you know, for different reasons, whether that's family, emotions, dependency. Um, and we see these as feminine values um, and we exclude them. And it's also about bringing those back into to economics, which I think would lead to economics asking slightly different questions, which would, for example, be more about I think will be better questions, particularly when it comes to sustainability and and uh, sort of surviving on this planet in, in the long term. So I think apart from just updating the models and looking at different things is also a value thing built in here um, that I think also needs to change for the for the sake of, of, of all of us, really. Thank you very much. I, I hear that reality is more important than theory sometimes. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, you're speaking to a journalist, so maybe we're biased, but it's, it's um, um, yes. Um, and also being, I think it's not just about correcting. I think in some sense, it's about correcting a mistake. Like we forgot about Adam Smith's mother, which meant we forgot about big chunks of the economy. Let's fix that. But I do also think it's this bigger value question. You know, what if we say economics is the science of self-interest? what values does that sort of uh, imply and how does that make us think about the economy is it the best way to think about the economy given you know the very real economic challenges we're facing now so that's you know it's a bigger question because economics also likes to think of itself as valueless and i don't think that's true thank you yes thank you thank you very much um and um, I would also like to ask you a question about the contents of the book. So one could argue that the discussion in the book uh, occurs on primarily two fronts, critics of economics as a discipline and of the economic uh, man concept, mm -hmm. and uh, highlighting the current situation of women in society. In the epilogue, though, you explicitly state that the purpose of both of these fronts is to change economics using a feminist perspective. In your most recent book, you engage with technology from a feminist perspective. How do you view the use of a feminist perspective in critiquing the problems, problems addressed in the book? And um, are there any limitations to this approach? <laughs> sorry um yes um great question no i am um, well there are limits to any approach um but um i do think that often um this little question um what about women is a very useful question in a lot of circumstances because it turns out that because you know the world is the way it is and and the history of the world women have been forgotten or excluded when it comes to a lot of things and just asking that question what about women often opens up a lot of interesting things and i've certainly used that as a journalist i mean you mentioned my my book uh, my, my most recent book which is called mother of invention which talks about technology and 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 innovation um just just looking at the the history of of innovation which you know we've taught to see in a certain way and asking that little question what about women suddenly you find find a lot of new things and the new stories and 
I mean, in that book, I talk about, I can suddenly answer things that have puzzled people for a long time, like, you know, why, why didn't we get wheels on suitcases until the 1970s? And, you know, why wasn't that, didn't that invention come earlier, which is something that a lot of people who are much more clever than me have thought about. But just because I have that feminist perspective, and I think, what about women? And you start to sort of looking into, you know, women and suitcase use, and then suddenly, a whole new story emerges. So I do think it's a useful approach. Um, and um, s- clearly, obviously limits to it, um, to it as well. But I think it's, it's also what, what fascinates me is that just writing women back into whether that's the, hist- the story of economics or the story of technology and innovation. Um, what I look at in that book, Mother of Invention, is how our definition of technology tends to follow our definition of masculinity. When women invent things, it doesn't count as technology. Even when women were developing software, it wasn't, my mother was a computer programmer, it wasn't considered to be very technical. So it's this sort of happens again and again, this exclusion of, of women. And when you bring women back in, it's not just out of fairness or because it it becomes like an interesting book hopefully it's it's also because I think it changes the whole story if you add Adam Smith's mother back into the story of economics economics fundamentally becomes something different suddenly you can see that whole cake that I had on the slide and suddenly also the values change because you know we can't just keep assuming that everybody does everything based just on self-interest Adam Smith's mother you know did she do what she did out of self-interest partly I mean, she was she didn't have many other economic opportunities in the, at the time, but I think it's fair to assume that she also did it out of love, out of care, out of consideration. So suddenly you have a whole different model of human behavior and also in a sense of values and what's important. And I think that's what's so magical with that little question. What about women? It changes the whole the story in ways that are very interesting, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think on this note, we already have related questions in um, Q&A. And uh, I think at this point, uh, we can switch to the discussion mode. Mm -hmm. So um, I think one question that um, a little bit overlaps uh, with what we've been talking about today already, but it also um, adds a broader perspective. And we have a question from um, Kokidoi. Um, Compare it to when the book was first published. Do you think that the field of economics is moving in a better direction, such as whether perspectives related to gender being included and the way the economic man is understood and so on and so forth? Yes, I do think so. Um, I, I very much think so. I think it has. I think the the financial crisis, which you know, as I mentioned, was the context for me writing this book ten years ago, did change a lot of things. I think the pandemic has changed things. You know, the way people look at these things, and I also think the positions of of women have moved forward um, in many ways, not always since, um, and that has also changed things and I also think with people being much more aware of um, the of climate change as a, a problem as an economic problem as you know probably the economic problem um, that also makes people look at at things differently uh, I mean fundamentally homo economicus can't handle <laughs> climate change um, it's it, it's you need to to look at the economy differently and include um, other aspects. Then we can sort of discuss, you know, how and in which way and how far to sort of move from the models. But I do think that is just the awareness of that problem um, has is changing economics uh, and making economics ask different questions. Um, and I think questions that also make many people aware of, of uh, the contributions of feminist economics. So yes, I do think things are moving in the right direction. Thank you very much. And uh, then immediately we have a related question uh, in the Q&A um, because we are discussing such things as uh, empathy or awareness. Um, and uh, 
uh, one of our viewers is interested in social psychology. And their question is, could you explain how the knowledge of um, psychology or social psychology can be used for better modeling and understanding of economics? Yeah, thank you. Yes, yes. So I'm not an expert on this. I mean, I know it's it's being done a lot. Um, um, and, you know, the, the field of behavioral economics is 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 obviously um, sort of a sort of psychology and and certain branches of psychology coming together with economics and doing experiments and and so on. Um, I don't know that much about social psychology in in general in order to answer that, but I do think, I guess one of the the big things in in uh, in this book is is just the need to to look at um, look at human beings and human situations and human groups and human societies. And the way they cooperate and act uh, as they are, and not just sort of stare at this theory. So I do think clearly there are lots of of, of benefits to those approaches, but I I don't know enough in order to sort of be able to point you in a in a certain direction on that one. I'm sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. And um, we have a lot of really exciting and interesting questions and. Uh, you, you could also um, see that there are some questions that were originally uh, written in English. So if you could also have a look through Q&A and maybe this time you could pick a, a question that you All right. have to answer. Uh, you want me to read and talk at the same time as hard. Um, uh, uh, yes, so there's a question from Anonymous here. I'm currently involved in raising a small child, so I sympathize greatly with the argument of the book. On the other hand, I couldn't agree with the use of Adam Smith as a scapegoat. Oh, good point. Smith is the moral philosopher who has been receiving attention again in recent years as part of the ethics of care. Yes, that is a very, very good point. Um, and um, I hope I, I, I made that, I tried to make that briefly uh, in the... Um, in my introduction as well, that I think Adam Smith himself would have been horrified uh, by how um, particularly some of his ideas around the invisible hand and self-interest um, has been used. Um, but I also do think that it is actually quite, uh, I mean, given how close he was to his mother and this other cousin that, that helped him with the household, that he's not even uh, thinking about that in terms of economics. I do think it's it's worth uh, pointing out. Um, and I am aware I do use him a bit as a scapegoat and that is um, probably a little bit unfair, but it's, it's in order to sort of do the story in an efficient way. And um, <clears throat> in the book, you know, I hope I, I also uh, bring up his, his other side um, enough, but that's, you know, that's a very, Good point. Um, uh, oh, the theory of moral sentiments is not in the city. It should be, I think. Um, um, do you think that we're also able to consider Smith an ally of feminist economics? I think that would be taking it a bit far, but I would be willing to listen to that argument. And I guess you think that, that based on the theory of moral sentiments. Um, 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 so the theory of moral sentiments is this other great work of Smith, which is um, um, very different from this emphasis on self-interest that economics has taken out of the wealth of nations. But what I am primarily interested in is, is, is not so much Smith's work as sort of what was taken from it and um, made into what we now call standard economic theory. Uh, and that's clearly not his fault. So that's a good uh, question. Um, um, shall I look at another one? Um, um, or do you have something? Uh, we have, I think we have a couple of questions with focus in Japan. We could uh, okay. uh, talk um, a little bit about uh, that. Uh, so one of the questions is, um, how can this book, what do you think, how can this book can um, or can contribute, or contribute to the situation of Japan where the women's condition is not necessarily um, the best among the OECD countries? Mm. Yes, um, so I've never had the, the pleasure of, of visiting um, 
Japan, I would obviously <laughs> love to. And I'm not, um, and uh, you know, and in any way um, knowledgeable very much to this situation at all. But I, I can make some some general points. Um, I do think increasingly in recent years there's been much more awareness about um, not just you know the just the economic importance of empowering women in society and how much um, even just looking at you know how an economy can benefit how important that is um, and I think therefore the conditions of women and for example things like the ability of women to to um, to combine work with with family is being discussed a lot more for example here in Europe as well so there's interesting research looking at that in Europe uh, the countries with the lowest fertility rates tend to be countries like Italy or Germany where it's harder for women to to combine career and family and that and slightly sort of more traditional ideas around um, maybe men staying home and uh, no women staying home and men going out to work and that there's an interesting research around how that leads to actually fewer children being born so that's a discussion in Europe um, and I, you know from my awareness that's those are issues that you know have also been been discussed in, in relation to the Japanese economy so I do think there is interesting thinking in in feminist economics around these things and also policy thinking on the on the importance of having care as as infrastructure and and also um, how societies you know really need to to look at the provision of of care whether that's for for children or or elderly people as as a very sort of fundamental economic problem to solve in order for for societies to be sustainable in in the long term so i think this this connection between longer term economic problems whether that's population growth or you know sustainability of of of, of a welfare system because you need taxpayers to pay into it connecting that to the question of, of women and the empowerment of women i think is a very useful policy exercise in 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 any country i would argue and you know and it'd be very interesting to to learn more about what you know that kind of thinking could provide in a in a Japanese uh, context. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, one thing that I believe this book can contribute to probably any um, situation is to raise awareness. Hmm. And in relation to that, I remember in our uh, discussion, uh, we had um, one question coming up quite uh, frequently. Who is your intended audience? <laughs> Who are the we uh, coming up in, in the book um, all the time? So sometimes um, you mentioned that we internalize some of the economic theories, that we believe in such yeah. things as economic man or economic behavior driven by pure self-interest. So who are we? Who are we? <laughs> <clears throat> Humanity. No, sorry, my, my voice. One second, I'm just. Um, um, yes, that's a good question. I mean, I did use the. So obviously, when I wrote it, I had I never thought it would be read outside of Sweden. Um, but I don't talk. It's not Swedish people I talk about when I say we. It's. Um, I think. I think that economics is. Um, and I do talk about this in the book too, I think in many ways, and in not all parts of the world, but in big parts of the world, um, because of globalization, it, it is in a way the religion of our time in that it's a value system with certain assumptions around individualism, rationality, self-interest, so on and so on, that we, we, here it comes again, that uh, have in a sense, as a collective um, internalized and um, that um, guides our way of thinking. And I think 
you know, when the big book of history is, is written at some point far in the future, it's something that, that uh, you know, the future generations will be able to see just how deep that type of thinking actually penetrated all sorts of disciplines and all sorts of, you know, our, even our way of speaking. I talk about this in the book too, the way we, we use the language of the market to describe ourselves. You know, I am investing in this relationship or, you know, economic thinking has really kind of penetrated um, society. Um, and I think that will be that will be something that the future future generations um, point out about our time. I think it was um, Joseph Campbell, the mythology scholar, that made this point. I think so about how the skyline of of the great cities of of the world, in a way, you can look at the highest buildings, the tallest buildings, and, and they are monuments to the dominating values of that time. So there clearly was a time, you know, medieval time where here in Europe or, or London where I live, where the tallest buildings were churches or religious buildings, which, you know, he sees as in a reflection of those were the, the values of, of, of the day and that's where the money was sort of flowing to. And then a city like London changed and in the 1800s there were sort of big public buildings like you know like railway stations or houses of parliament that were the tallest buildings. And now currently if you look out in of most in most great cities of the world the tallest buildings almost everywhere are banks and financial institutions which is kind of an embodiment of the values of a certain type of financial capitalism which I and I so I do think in a sense that economic man is is living within all of us um and um and it's something that really affects our thinking and i think that's why i chose to to use that we because i think often people you talk about neoliberalism or or as you know some big conspiracy over there but i do actually think it's it's something that's very integral to how all of us think in these uh, times Thank you very much. We also talked with um, um, our colleagues, uh, economists, uh, about the book, and I think um, at some point the discussion was uh, turning towards misunderstanding that we is not this this kind of we, but it's we economists. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I think. Wow. It, caused some um, uh, misunderstanding as oh, well. Okay, interesting. No, I, I mean it much wider. I mean it much wider, I think, yeah. Okay, we, we still have a lot of interesting questions. And I think, uh, well, it's probably a breakfast time in the UK and it's around the dinner time here in Japan. And we have a couple of questions building up on the uh, metaphor. So one uh, of the questions, I will just read it out. Hello, my name is uh, Cynthia Rizani. I hope I'm pronouncing uh, your name correctly. I'm sorry if I'm not. I have recently defended my dissertation at Northwestern University, and I truly wished I could share my appreciation for Catherine Marcel's work and share that when I taught an undergraduate course at Northwestern, I used Who Cooked Adam Smith dinner in class, and the students loved it. The course was on Uzzathon literature and the crisis of marriage. My question is, you mentioned an economist who compared the economy to the baking of cake. I was wondering if you were familiar with another pastry metaphor, the donut economy, coined by Kate Revolt and whether you see uh, this as a kind of shift towards the sort of economic thinking that you allocated in your book. Yeah. Yes, yeah, thank you for that. And thank you for, for using my, my book with your students. Yes, Kate Rawley's work, yes, I do. Um, I, I, I do think it's, she's doing great work on the donut economy. And, and I think that's particularly the type of um, thinking where sort of the challenge of sustainability and um, the environment um, and sustainability in all sorts of dimensions is is making forcing a lot of people to rethink and I think her sort of donut model and also the way many cities use it in order to think differently about their local economies is is very um, inspiring and she's 
also been very kind and supportive of my of my latest book mother of invention so um yes i do think it's it's very interesting what uh, what she's doing and all the i mean there are these donut economics labs around the world where people are trying to put these ideas into into practice and i think that's very very inspiring thank you very much and um another question linking uh to uh, this one. Um, I thought your book was great, but there were pros and cons among my friends. They agreed that you accurately pointed out the absence of a vision about the living world in economics, thought, and the gender issue. The critical opinion was that this was a white feminist perspective. As you wrote, Virginia Woolf, a wealthy white woman, did not cook either. But to maintain a lockable room where she could be alone, she needed a staff to bring food there and maintain the room. And today, many of them are not Adam Smith's mother or Margaret, but immigrants from poor countries, women among them, who are in charge of the household. In my own opinion, there is an economic disparity between East and West, even among the same European women. And the same composition of economic disparity exists among Asian women. So I would like to explore the possibility of solidarity beyond such issues, assuming that the concept of women is not monolithic. I would like to hear your opinion as a journalist on these issues. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's 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 very um, a very good point. I mean, I do talk in the book, I think quite a lot about, I mean, maybe not enough, about you know the care change care change in the global economy going from from poor economies and um and into sort of richer economies and how you know how that impacts for example the economy of the, the philippines and i don't think i talk about i talk about the how nurses are um you know moving from from certain african countries to countries where they're where there is 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 better pay and and the different impacts of that and how that's this really is a a a global issue uh, and I talk about um, I do talk about the domestic domestic workers and you know how that tends to be um, you know women of color and and the hierarchies around that I mean I mean clearly obviously there could have been more around that but I I do I mean happy to to hear a disagreeing point and, and and take this into account but I, I do think that's that's in the book that's certainly my intention but then obviously that those things could always be done better or or, or clearer but but there was there's certainly issues I I I think about or or you know in the epilogue you know I I, I use the the example of the um, the famous, I can't forget her, I forget her name, of, of a, a woman in, in the US who had to leave her kids in the car because she had to go for a job interview and how that sort of story is also connected to, to race and things. So, so I hope that's in the book and, um, you know, but I'm taking any um, suggestions on, you know, how to, to improve that, of course, because it's, it's, um, it's an extremely important point you make that the experience of of woman is is not monolithic and whenever we make it uh monolithic we just mean you know white uh women and take that as some kind of universal experience which it's it's obviously not and i think with the even with the image of the the, the cake economy there is certainly sort of a race and ethnicity and power perspective to be to be added to to that as well and that work is is, is very important Yes, thank you very much. And another question I think links to this one, um, but it is more about um, perspectives or your vision of uh, perspectives. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting topic. How would economics and society change if women would get paid for all and paid jobs that they have been doing for centuries uh, yeah yeah that'd be very very you'd have a very big <laughs> wealth shift in the global economy um yeah it'd be, it'd be very different um i i think i i don't know if it's even possible to do it under the current monetary system i mean i guess it would be um 
um, it's I think it's a useful exercise to to think about. Um, I I do think um, I mean on a more kind of practical level, I think that the, the issues to push for is sort of you know for example things like better um, um, better conditions for domestic workers and uh, and uh, you know childcare opportunities for 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 women and higher wages in in care professions in in general. Um, <clears throat> So I think, you know, you know, it's 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 useful to think, you know, what would happen if if women would would get paid and 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 what what that would would mean. But uh, but I think if we should be practical and and pragmatic, it's it's more those sort of policy areas that I would like to to see uh, change. But I mean, obviously, the calculations and they're in the book. You know how how um, you know women's unpaid contributions to just to healthcare. Um, they think it's, I think it's the UN, it's 2.35% uh, of global GDP. So that's like 1.5 trillion US dollars. So it's huge sums. And that's just women's unpaid contributions to healthcare. We're not even talking uh, childcare or, or anything else. So it's this, like that, the part of the cake that we're ignoring is, is very, very big. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I was wondering if we have any additional questions from our panelists, or maybe comments. Oh, Naoko, please. Yes, I just wanted to shed light on one of the questions uh, raised by the audience about uh, your uh, future writing plans. After reading your book, I'm very intrigued to know if you have any inspirations for next work and what kind of issues you would like to um, focus on. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, so I've written Mother of Invention, which is about technology, which is about to come out in, in Japanese, which is wonderful. Um, and, um, and I'm currently working on a book called uh, A Woman's Worth, which is more specifically around um, women's economic history and, and money. Um, and then I've, um, yeah, and then I, then I probably going to do something very different. <laughs> um also within the field of, of, of economics but um but those uh, that that's what i'm working on at the moment it's called a woman's a woman's worth um and it's it's more specifically around because i guess adam smith's dinner it was about economics and then mother of invention is about innovation and technology and now it's sort of really uh, money risk um you know uh, women's economic history um, it's just um, I tend to just do what I'm what I'm interested in trying to figure out for, for myself because it takes a bit of stamina to to write a whole book at least for me so I need to be um, kind of genuinely interested in what uh, you know figuring out some answers to some of these questions myself so that tends to be my thinking around these things. Thank you and you said you are going to move to something completely different I'm very curious what you. Oh, I, I'm very interested in the bond market and climate change, actually. So that's very different. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. We will be looking forward to your new books. And um, uh, any any other additional questions from um, panelists? Otherwise, uh, I have uh, one question. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it overlaps with um, some of the questions we discussed today already, um, but have you seen any significant improvements in the working environment for women in business or in journalism and politics after you published uh, the book? Um, if so what kind of improvements mm. have you witnessed? Yes, I, I do think uh, there's been improvements around um, awareness of things like sexual harassment in the workplace. I mean, with the here in, in, in Europe, the Me Too movement that started in the US around um, sexual harassment was, you know, has, I think, changed things. Um, I think even when I started out as a journalist, there was much more of, of, of those type of problems than there are today, even though there's still a problem. So I think, I think that's 
um, certainly a thing. Um, I do think it's depressing how the gender pay gap is not closing quicker. I mean, I am Swedish and we have a, a reputation of being um, a very, um, you know, a country very focused on gender equality. And we like to think of ourselves as having the solution to many of these problems. But if you actually look at the figures, the gender pay gap in Sweden is, is still there and not moving the uh, gender um, gender segregation on the labor market is a very big problem and um, and it's just not happening it seems to be quite stuck even in in Scandinavia on on many measurements so that's that I do find quite worrying and I do think we need much more of a discussion you know a comparative discussion between different countries and different models because I think some some economies have solved some problems and others have not and particularly as Scandinavians, we tend to think that we've solved everything and we really haven't. Um, and I think we need to be much more uh, interested in other uh, countries, even when it comes to things like, like gender equality um, issues. Um, but yes, you know, certainly improvements. I think awareness has been amazing. I think, um, you know, the question that came here earlier around sort of the problems of white feminism and having a very sort of narrow focus I think there's been a lot happening in the last couple of years there's been and some great books published uh, I think that is is very encouraging um, and you know more women being interested in economics I think that's that's also great yes it's actually I think you probably have seen this question in uh, uh, the Q&A it links to the question um, I will read it out but mm -hmm. to uh, just summarize it it's a question about uh, incorporating ra race and racialization in discussion of gender and economics. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for your illuminating work, which was helpful in thinking about the intersection of gender and economics using a feminist lens. Your book ended with the story of um, Shanisha Taylor, yes. a rich black parent who was imprisoned when she left her children in the car as she attended a job interview. Are the authors using uh, a racial capitalism lens would perhaps look at how the global economy was structured based on racial hierarchies. Your book was written 10 years ago, and since then we have witnessed more discussion about mm -hmm. how race intersects with uh, conversations about economics, gender, and so on. In the future, are you interested in incorporating race and uh, racialization in the discussion of gender economics? Yes, yes. Um, I still think I do it to some extent in this book. I think probably if I've written it now, as you say, I would have done it um, more. There's um, a friend of mine, Koa Beck, who's written, well, friend, but I, I know her now after she wrote her book called White Feminism. And she actually talks about Adam Smith's dinner in the context of, of some of these more sort of race, race questions. So if you're interested in you know somebody who is sympathetic to my work but sort of taking it into maybe more of today's and specifically looking at and also it's a, it's a very interesting book in general about it's quite focused on the US unfortunately but but that's that's the market for for her book but but she does talk about um you know domestic labor basing it on some of the things thoughts in my book and and sort of discussing it in that context so that would be something you if you were interested in that you could look at uh, and but clearly there's there's a lot more but I do agree with you there's there's really been um, a lot of um, learning and great books out um, in the last decade around those issues which also again even just from from the very narrow perspective of understanding the economy better you know just in, incorporating these sort of understanding of those power structures um, is is incredibly important um, so, um, so yes. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, hmm. we have one question that I am. Um, I'm curious about. Uh, mm, so. I will just uh, read it out. It's a translated question. Adam Smith studied um, this thing we know 
we now think of as economics and society and succeeded in giving them structure. However, I thought it was an interesting phenomenon, as you say, that he did not talk about himself or the work that made his work possible, his mother's work, and apparently didn't feel the need to do so. I also think it's an excellent point. Um, and the continuation of the question, I think, is also, do you have any ideas as to why the economy and society have allowed this situation to situations to occur? And if so, any ideas as to the factors? Is it possible, for example, that often women themselves have wanted their actions to remain unspoken with the context of the economy? And can you give an examples of men's behavior um, that should be remarked on? Oh, <laughs> I don't know if women, I mean, I think, I think for Adam Smith, clearly it was, it was just, I think the assumptions that made him just not think about his mother. I think he really appreciated, I think, I think that's what's interesting. I think he really appreciated what she did. Uh, and he clearly loved her. He was very close to her. And I think he realized he couldn't function without her and this, this, the cousin, uh, Janet Douglas. So what's interesting that in spite of that, you know, it wasn't like he was a bad man or something. In spite of that, he just couldn't see it as sort of part of, of, of the economy. And, and I think that's what's so interesting. And then there's a lot of really deep assumptions there about, you know, that's just what women do. That's that that will never change. It's just a natural resource. It's natural for women. And I think they were just so deep um, for him that it didn't it just didn't occur to to think about that as an as an economic economic question. And that's, all, you know, based on these sort of old, you know, women, private sphere, men, public sphere sort of assumptions. Um, what was the rest of the question? It was um, uh, if women, I, if women don't want to be recognized, I don't think so. Uh, why? Why wouldn't they? I, I'm not. I don't think I. I agree with that. You know, they want to be in the background. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, patriarchy works for everybody, but but no, I, I don't think I agree with that. Um, but willing to hear more, obviously. And then male behavior that should be pointed out. Um, well, I mean, I think we should all um, acknowledge. I mean, I try to acknowledge the the work my my husband does. So he is is um, you know um, primary the primary uh, person looking after our uh, children. And um, you know, I I hope that I acknowledge um, how that makes it possible for me to to do things like like I'm doing right now that he's looking after the children and and I think the world we want to move to towards is is a world where you know men have the opportunity to do these things as well and women and and children can benefit from close relationships with with you know everybody who who loves them and more people and 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 I think that's that's somehow the uh, the vision and also where sort of the economic importance of that type of care work is is acknowledged and and uh, not just appreciated in many cases paid better. Um, you can do that in different ways, but but that's that's sort of the vision I have and want to move towards. Thank you very much. Bill. I think also one of um, the reasons um, why your book is such a bestseller in Japan right now, is that still a lot of things that um, we um, and you are talking about are probably very, very relevant to contemporary Japanese society. And um, we have another question about Japan uh, in Q&A, uh, saying that Japan has not promoted gender equality policies to the same extent as the Scandinavian countries. Uh, the awareness among the general population is also low. How can Japanese stakeholders change the situation? As a developed country, what are some ways to influence key people in, in the country in Japan? What do yeah. you think? I do think it's often very useful to translate issues into languages that 
society takes more seriously. And I think economics is, is a language taken very seriously. So I do think there is a lot of, you know, take, take problems, you know, general economic problems that a country might have, for example, low fertility rates or, um, you know, aging population and who should look after the aging, aging population, you know, which are, those are very fundamental problems to an economy, you know, having those problems. And then if you could sort of tie the, which you can, because <laughs> women are very integral to that, tie these issues of, you know, actually gender equality here or um, could actually help with these things, then suddenly often you can get people to listen. So it's about putting it in that way a lot. And, and Scandinavia is, in, and when, when a lot of the things that Scandinavia is now admired for, you know, the very big investments, you know, 4% of GDP into maternity and paternity leave and, you know, all the dads pushing buggies in, in Stockholm, you know, when those um, policies were put in place, it was, it was often because it was a solution to a more general economic problem. Uh, you know, we need more women on the labor market. Okay, what do we do? Um, often that was, I mean, some historians would argue with me there, but I would say that's probably more often the case. And I think there's a lot to, to, to learn from, from, from that in terms of getting um, sort of mainstream society to, to listen to these concerns. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, education can um, really affect these issues? We have one of the questions asking, I wonder if the standard economics course in the courses in universities are changing in any way to include women's perspectives. Do you think it, it is happening or do you think it is efficient way to change these? Yeah, things? I do so. I mean, I so I studied a bit of economics um, and and I was already then very angry about, uh, uh, you know, how um, women's perspectives were not included and um, now, sort of 20 years on, um, you know, they use they use who cooked Adam Smith's dinner at Stockholm School of Economics. I mean, not the main courses, but they they um, they do use it. Um, so I do think uh, these things are changing, and I do think it's it is it is important. It really is important to sort of widen uh, economics in in that way, and and. And also because also even you know economics can really help with with big policy challenges and the nature of a lot of the big policy challenges mean that you know women are integral and this perspective is integral to 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 solving them which is why it needs to be studied and thought about more i believe thank you thank you very much and thank you for um your um, amazing contribution to the studying process <laughs> and to educate educational process for 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 me it was a very educational experience to really do because i am myself a linguist and uh, i am quite far from economical issues in my uh, research so um it was i had a lot of discoveries while, while reading your book and i was also when i was reading it um i was wondering I remember that uh, there, there was one chapter that was reminding that if 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 I remember correctly, that was reminding women that it is okay to get paid. Yes. Do you think still in um, in the UK and Scandinavia and Europe, um, it is a relevant Thing to remind women do we still need to remind women that it is okay yes. <clears throat> paid for yeah them? I do think so I think that chapter talks about nursing right and Florence Nightingale and how she um because I, I think even on a more macro scale I do think there's this in certain female dominated professions in the global economy it's it's sort of we just see it as completely natural that domestic workers, for example, is not, uh, shouldn't be highly paid. Um, and that's something I talk about in my other book, Mother of Invention, um, that actually, 
you know, you could look at it with certain developments of artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence really struggling with things like cleaning more than it struggles with other things that this is an area where human workers should actually be paid a lot more. Um, but I think there are a lot of gendered assumptions around that. And that's, I talk more about this in Mother of Invention. But so I do think on a macro scale, I think the, the way the labor market is, is shaped were sort of uh, we just assume that certain female dominated professions should always be low paid. And, um, you know, that doesn't have to be the case. You know, the the, the pay of, of, you know, um, you know, computer programmers didn't used to be paid very much when they were women. <laughs> and then that changed. So so these things. So, so I don't just mean it, I think, from an individual perspective. I also think it in sort of, you know, wh how we think of, of the labor market and what's what we assume should be highly paid and, and, and not very highly paid and how that's connected to, among other things, gender. But yes, I do also think on an individual um, level, I think women uh, can and should be encouraged um, to do that because we still, we, I mean, we know from, from research that that's what happens in, in salary negotiations to a, to a large extent that women are not uh, condition to to ask for more in the same way and you know and that will have a big impact on that individual woman's life uh, for decades really if you don't go for 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 a salary raise while a man could would do so in the same situation so so yeah I do think so thank you thank you very much such a lovely discussion I I would ask you my many more questions but we are running out of time and we need to wrap uh, today's discussion up before we do so i would like to thank you again for your book and for your time today and uh, for this amazing discussion i'm also really grateful to tokyo college for giving us this opportunity to have this kind of discussion and to all of my colleagues for participating in uh, um, this discussion. And um, it would not be as exciting as educational without the participation of our viewers. Uh, thank you very much for your questions. And uh, thanks a lot to our amazing translators. Before uh, we say goodbye, goodbye, uh, I have a little announcement. So, dear viewers, if you enjoy um, Tokyo College research and our outreach uh, activities, please uh, consider supporting uh, Tokyo College. You can uh, find QR codes um, um, with information on the slide. And um, thanks to everyone. Um, thank you all for your time. And it's our time to uh, say goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs>